Hey everyone, welcome to Takisoba. I'm your host, the Anime Casual Nate. This time, I'm here to talk about Ghosts in the Shell. Except, it's not any of these versions that are just shown on screen. No, the one I'm reviewing isn't even an anime. For the first time on this channel, I'm going to be talking about a manga. It's something different for me, but I think it'll be worth it. The Ghosts in the Shell is a manga created by Masamune Shiro and was originally published between 1989 and 1991 as individual chapters. Unlike a lot of popular manga, The Ghost in the Shell didn't actually continue as multiple volumes in the same overarching story. It got direct sequels that stand apart from one another, and reading the original manga is basically like reading a single graphic novel. In fact, I read the English version published by Dark Horse, which was modified to read left to right. This is the version shown on screen, since it's the only copy I could get scans of. I don't actually prefer this modified version, but I think that makes it pretty accessible to new manga readers in the West. The story of the original manga takes place in the year 2029 and focuses on a fictional Japanese government sector known as Public Security Section No. 9. Shortened to Section 9, they are an elite special ops force made up of former military officers and police detectives. Their goal is to subdue cybercriminal activities and corruption in public affairs, which other task forces are not able to handle. Now, to be clear, this review does not exist in a vacuum. While I did read this manga before watching other works in the Ghost in the Shell franchise, I waited until after I watched those other works to write this review of the manga, so naturally, I'll make some comparisons. I think the biggest difference in the manga compared to later works in the franchise is that the manga is actually not very deep and philosophical. Those are words used to describe much of the other works in the franchise, but I feel that there is actually not a lot of that showcased here in the manga. Additionally, the manga does not have much of an overarching plot at all. I didn't find this to be a negative, and it makes sense considering that the manga was published as individual chapters originally. It makes the manga seem more like an anthology of experimental ideas. There's entire chapters which have interesting stories, but are largely self-contained. In fact, the majority of this manga is actually original material which never got adapted. If you're familiar with the 1995 film, that adapts only a few chapters of the manga. The film focuses on the Puppet Master, referred to as the Puppeteer in the Dark Horse manga translation. The character is largely similar in both works, but since it is the focus of the film plot, it explores some of the concepts of sentience, consciousness, and feeling in much deeper ways. In the manga, the Puppeteer is not introduced until more than halfway through the book. As I mentioned, it is largely episodic. There are chapters involving the Major directly, and other characters going through one-time conflicts, and some earlier chapters in the events in them only tie loosely together once in a while. There's a lot of action and stuff closer to spy thriller than, say, psychological mind-break stuff that the movie is well known for. Ultimately, I found the manga story quite shallow and not entirely interesting. Another big problem I have with the manga is the amount of techno babble. That's the dialogue focusing on explaining the science fiction that exists in this world. Some of the explanation goes on for multiple pages, but doesn't actually explain anything. It says a lot, while at the same time, saying very little. Certain concepts are easy to grasp at a surface level, and I don't think there was a need to go any further. Take for example the most obvious sci-fi concept in the story, cybernetic humans. Basically, there are two things to know. The cybernetic body parts, and the cybernetic brain. A human can have mostly natural parts, but a cybernetic brain, which allows them to link up with certain networks and people to essentially communicate telepathically. Inversely, some people can have cybernetic body parts, but a natural brain, which isn't that different from the real-world concept of prosthetics. Then the most advanced thing you have is an entirely cybernetic body, where the only natural thing is the brain cells inside. The story describes the consciousness of a person as being their ghost, and the cybernetic body is the shell, hence the name of the franchise. Motoko is one such character with a fully cybernetic body and brain. In the book, a lot of this is explained in not the most interesting way. In the movie, for example, some of the most well-known shots involve showcasing cybernetic design, and these shots have absolutely no dialogue. Later, in the standalone complex series, for example, much of the core technology is explained briefly and lends itself to visual storytelling again to get the point across. It's certainly interesting in manga form, but I didn't need a full lecture every couple of chapters. The 1995 film dives into more detail about what it means to be human, how much of your brain is your ghost, and how real or unique that ghost is. It can give you a lot to chew on for sure, but in the manga, it isn't delivered in as serious of a tone. In the film, Motoko interacts with the Puppet Master in a way that makes her question the very nature of her existence, and this is still adapted from the manga, however I feel like the manga concept just isn't taken quite that far. 
The manga does end on the puppeteer arc, which lines up close-ish to the movie, but it just didn't have the same impact. After reading the manga, I found myself feeling a similar way to when I first watched the original Blade Runner. It's heralded as a cult classic, but that movie didn't do a lot for me either. I think it falls into the same trap of presenting itself as something profound, but doesn't really go far enough to make the reader slash viewer really think for themselves and ponder something that is not commonly thought about. There's also some clear inspiration from Blade Runner in Ghost in the Shell in general, so if you did like Blade Runner, the manga is definitely going to be up your alley. Back on a positive note, the artwork is amazing. Some of the character design between pages is a bit simplified, but that kind of falls in line with the other manga from this era and lends itself to a more goofy tone sometimes. On the other hand, some of the background art and mechanical shots are very detailed and really shift the tone over to something more serious and worthy of slow page turning. With high octane action involving tanks and guns, followed by a slow paced scene showcasing intricate anatomy and bodywork of cybernetic shells, it's definitely a juxtaposition of styles, but one that works very well and is all around a pleasure to look at and keeps things fresh. Having watched the 1995 movie and then the standalone complex TV series before writing this review, one of the most interesting things to me looking back on the manga was the range of facial expressions in the characters, particularly the Major. Again, there are a lot of tropes showcased here, particularly in the comedic moments, but the Major really varies a lot in this original source material, and she is taken way more seriously in the movie. I don't really think she makes most of these faces in the movie or TV series, and it's amusing to look back on them. Most of the characters in the manga are not explored in great depth, but I don't think that's really a huge downside. When I read it at first, it didn't bother me, and having watched the film and TV adaptations, which explore the characters more fully, I definitely enjoyed that more. But having the original manga as my only frame of reference the first time around, I didn't feel like anything was really missing. The Major is obviously the main character, being the field leader of the group, and the one with the most advanced, fully cybernetic body and skill set. We get some good moments with her, but things such as her backstory are not fully explored in depth. There is, however, a manga unique chapter involving her and someone she's dating, which helps to humanize her a bit more. With this being left out of the film, as well as some other playful interactions, the manga might actually be better than the film in this aspect. As for the other characters such as Bato, Togusa, and the rest, they also get some good characterization, but not much. After later watching the standalone complex, the character development in the manga pales in comparison to that. But that's to be expected, and the groundwork is still being laid here in the manga. Despite my complaints, I think it's still worth a read, even if you're like me and it's your first exposure to the franchise. If you're someone who's already watched the 1995 film or the series Standalone Complex, both considered masterpieces in their own regard and pretty cerebral overall, you might find the original manga a bit lacking to go back to, but hey, it's just one volume, a single book. Treating it like the 1980s cyberpunk action thriller that it is keeps your expectations in check. Aside from some of the techno babble mentioned earlier, the dialogue is mostly easy to follow and a disjointed and episodic story lends itself to being more easy to pick up and put down. Overall, while I walked away from reading it feeling mostly unsatisfied, that might just be because most people have recommended the film or the anime series to me instead of the actual manga. I just personally wanted to read the manga first, and my expectations might have not been in check. As a side note, there are sequels to the manga primarily Ghost in the Shell 1.5 and 2.0, but I didn't read them since I just wasn't very interested. The first book is wrapped up nicely, so I'm fine with skipping it. The book really doesn't lead into anything necessarily. All said, the manga is visually impressive, relatively short, and generally worth your time to read. The very core of the story and world building did interest me and gave me motivation to watch the later adaptations, since I felt it could really only get better the deeper the rabbit hole goes. And that it did. This is a truly classic manga, and it's always interesting to see where big franchises begin. It's still popular enough to be at your local library, so hey, go pick it up, have a good time. Thanks for watching the Takasobu review for The Ghost in the Shell. Please give it a like or comment for feedback, and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on some more upcoming reviews of Ghost in the Shell material. It's gonna be interesting.